special relativity you probably need a substantial review of because you know of all these topics the topics that need substantial amount of math that's why you know you cannot take physics optics you could have covered a lot of optics as your first semester material special relativity and quantum mechanics not really because they both require a fair amount of mathematics and we did this quite a while ago because it was chapter five we did cover it before quantum mechanics so uh, you should plan on reviewing fair amount of special relativity beyond the simply memorizing you know, energy and momentum formulas. That was good enough for the parts that related to particle physics. But for the final exam, I could ask you special relativity proper questions. And so you should plan on reviewing. And um, so you know, with the special relativity, there's once again the, all the background the material, mechanism of Morley experiment, the two postulates of special relativity, the principle of relativity, and the fact that speed, there is a universal speed limit, which happens to match with the speed of light. Um, so everyone's OK with the background material, right? Yeah. So that's the kind of just background material that we can cover in any physics class. For this calculus-based engineering physics, really your starting place is Lorentz transformation. That's the centerpiece of special relativity. It's the one mathematical thing that includes all the I, nearly all the ideas that are in special relativity. So you should uh, review and feel familiar with the Lorentz transformation under many different contexts. So, well, at least the two different contexts. So the one is the context where it was first introduced. So there's the simple Lorentz transformation of space-time coordinate. So if you have, um, or so, so if you are dealing with this, uh, two different reference frames, one reference frame that's ostensibly at rest, and another reference frame that's moving at some speed. Let's say it's moving at speed of v to right, and we call this the S prime frame, and the unmoving frame is S frame. The goal in special relativity is to relate, um, given a single point, given a single point, and you have its coordinates in one reference frame, you want to be able to relate that those coordinates to the coordinates in the other re reference frame, right? So, so that's the goal of, that's what the transformation does. So let's say you have the coordinates of this point in terms of your S frame, the unprimed coordinate. Then what you want to know is what is my primed coordinate? T prime, X prime, Y prime, and Z prime. And I have C here, speed of light C, for unit purposes, so that the units match up. And Lorentz transformation says that these coordinates are transformed this way. Coordinates y and z don't change at all. You can kind of intuitively see there why. So y and z don't change at all. Uh, the position coordinate, a good portion of the change is something that you could have intuitively guessed. This is what we used to call, what we call Galilean transformation. That coordinate in terms of x, x, x prime in terms of x, so well, take the x coordinate, subtract um, the how fast it's moving times time, how much this axis has moved. Let me write it in a little bit weird way. Beta times ct. Now, the thing that changes in special relativity is there's a new scaling factor. Okay. Um, since I'm using this new notation, well, not new, um, but these letters, let me redefine them. So beta is speed as a fraction of speed of light. And gamma is um, the factor that's defined this way. It's one over square root of one minus beta squared. Just happens so many times that if you didn't define it, you would get tired of writing it. Now the surprising thing for which there is actually no intuition, and this is really the fundamental base, well, fundamental. Um, this is the reason for all those special relativity paradoxes, is that the time coordinate changes too. 
in the, um, so in, in the Newtonian mechanics, you would have said it's just the C times, you know, just time, absolute time. And the way this is different from this is here, you at least recognize that motion matters here. Here, before it used to be that motion didn't matter, but it turns out it actually matters. So it, this CT really should be CT minus beta x. And once you see, you can kind of see why this used to be ignored. Because usually in everyday circumstance, beta is a tiny number, fraction of the speed of light. So if you're moving at one meter per second, it's one part in you know, 300 million. So um, you wouldn't notice it, but as beta gets closer to one, this becomes a significant. And turns out there's also scaling factor gamma here also. And once you put all this in, these two actually does uh, look beautifully symmetrical. And you've seen the version where it's written out as a matrix. If you use that, that's fine with me. I just wrote it this way. Um, so this is the space-time coordinate Lorentz transformation. But really, it, you know, it's just as we are reviewing, what you should remember is the idea of four vector that, in, that we introduced. Um, the idea is that this particular arrangement of quantities, it's not, um, it's not a one-time thing. It's not something that applies to just the coordinate variables. We call this, four, this, this idea of four vector because what we are trying to get you to think about is in terms of analogy to three vector or the spatial vector. So spatial vector could be um, as a, you know, this set of numbers x, y, z coordinates. But we use that same mathematical tool to describe things that have direction, like velocity, momentum, um, anything that has direction now becomes a vector. So four vector is the same thing. It's anything that transforms under this shift of reference frame, like Lorentz transformation, is a four vector. Um, and I can tell you one thing that's not a four vector and one thing that is a four vector. One thing that is not a four vector and you have to be careful with is velocity. Your traditional idea of uh, um, the three dimensional velocity, it's not a four vector. That's kind of why I never really deal with the velocity transformation laws. Um, you should have that in your formula sheet, but I'm never going to ask you detailed questions involving velocity transformation law because um, it's not a four vector, it gets messy. <laughs> so I don't want to deal with it. I want to avoid it as much as possible. Um, there is a something called a four velocity, but I never introduce it because four velocity is very different from what you traditionally think of as velocity. So I didn't think it was uh, worth uh, introducing. Um, sorry, red is wrong color. But what is um, what I can in what we did introduce and what we did use is the idea of four momentum. So this is the energy and momentum combined into a quantity like this. It turns out energy takes the time coordinate, and the three components of momentum takes the position coordinate. So you can describe transformation of um, so transformation of energy and momentum, energy momentum Lorentz transformation. So it's a kind of trying to compare energy and momentum of one particle in one reference frame with energy and momentum in another, of the same particle, same thing, in another reference frame, it takes this form. If you know the energy and momentum in one frame, so all these unprimed quantities are known, then you can get these primed quantities, E prime, let me make the units come out right, over C, P prime X, P prime Y, P prime Z, then it turns out the rule that transforms this is the exact same one that does the coordinate. So the y and z component of momenta don't change. The x component transforms like this. So it would be gamma times the x, oops, no primes here, px minus beta, the velocity, the relative velocity factor, times the time coordinate, or e over c. And the energy transforms, um, transforms like this. So gamma times energy minus beta, oops, energy E over C minus beta uh, X component of momentum. Okay. 
And this in particular, I um, thought there was an exam question that used it. Well, there was on exam too, right? On special relativity? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. So like things dealing with the collisions, uh, sometimes you can use this to transform your energy moment from one reference frame, let's say rest frame of a particle, to um, frame where the particle is moving. That is probably not as useful because there you might feel like, oh, I, re I know that already. Because you could say that, oh, I know this formula. Energy is equal to gamma mc squared. Momentum is equal to gamma mv. So if you know how fast something is moving, you can calculate all this out and you can just figure that out. You don't need a Lorentz transformation. But where this Lorentz transformation is useful is if you have a reference frame where the particle is moving, and you have another reference frame where the particle is still moving. Meaning, um, so, and you are given, let's say, energy and momentum of one frame, and you know how to go from one frame to the other frame. If you are trying to go through this formula, the calculation will be, become very unwieldy. But if you do it by Lorentz transformation, it will be a lot simpler. Yeah. So, so that's another uh, Lorentz four vector. That, um, and this is why I'm, Writing here, both the kinematics, which deals with the coordinates, and dynamics, which deals with the energy and momentum, and you know collisions that, um, yeah, um, they are both tied together by a simple single thing, Lorentz transformation, because they both are they both transform under Lorentz transformation the exact same way. Now there are some other formulas that you ought to know, like. Um, well, OK, I shouldn't have demoted it as a formula. Um, so there's the energy and momentum formulas. You ought to know them. And there's also the energy momentum relationship. Uh, that E squared is equal to um, the rest energy, mc squared, squared plus pc squared. So I guess if you have it memorized in that form, it's fine. but um, uh, okay, so I, I will tell you this much that this is not something I can test you on because I don't think we spent near enough time. But it's the idea of invariant mass, uh, Lorentz invariant quantity. And it ties into the four vector formalism. The, if you had a vector, you take a dot product of vector with another vector, that dot product is rotationally invariant. When you are doing any rotation stuff, the um, uh, the, the dot product doesn't change. And the Lorentz invariant is the same mathematical idea in the context of four vector. So when you change your reference frames, um, the, the Lorentz invariant quantity doesn't change. So here, the energy is not a Lorentz invariant quantity. It's a component of four vector. The components will change when you change reference frames. But what is the Lorentz invariant is the mass. And the way the, it, you could write it that highlights this fact better is this way. Um, m squared, I think. No, sorry. Do the correct units. mc squared is equal to the time component e over c squared minus the spatial component momentum squared. And so what this is expressing is, well, mass of a particle, it's a constant. It's property of that particle. That rest mass, it's an invariant quantity. And however you combine this, however its energy and momentum change, they must change in a way that when it's combined this way, it doesn't change. It, you, you always get the same value, invariant. So calculationally, this is useful because sometimes when you have a collision analysis, you can kind of take the the four vector dot product with itself to get a quantity that's a, um, that doesn't depend on what reference frame you are in. So you could do the calculation in a convenient reference frame where, right? Sounds familiar. I think there was one exam question like that. Yeah? Uh, but why the idea of uh, dot product of four vector is different from general dot product? Like in general I, it's a, I think I called it geometry of space time. And what you have to remember is that here, the relationship that holds is so the invariant idea. The invariant interval, delta s squared, is expressed this way. Delta s squared is the time interval squared, 
c delta t squared minus the minus the position interval squared delta x you know, dot product itself or squared. And you can actually prove this using how gamma and beta were defined. And there is a uh, kind of expressed geometry called the uh, hyperbolic rotation. I think, did I even mention that? Yeah, I think I mentioned it briefly. But that's something that I won't, will not test you on. I do want you to know that this is an invariant quantity because that's calculationally useful. Um, here, yeah. so yeah, this idea of invariant interval, that's important. It, it, this goes into you know, space-like, time-like separation, and, but I'm not gonna get too deep into that. If anything, I'd rather you focus more on things like, um, well, things like uh, uh, time dilation. Um, so things like a time dilation and length contraction, uh, proper length divided by gamma. Like these were some of the key results in um, special relativity kinematics. I'd rather make sure you understood this thoroughly. Now for those of you who want more material, I um, didn't realize this when we were covering special relativity or I would have given it to you. Um, but now that I have realized that it's there, um, let me point it out, but I, want, I can't emphasize this, this enough. It's optional. You are not required to read it. Um, anything that you have to know, it's, uh, it's already covered in your homework. So it's this day four, five, six notes, because this is actually typed notes on special relativity that I spent like three weeks typing over summer when I had nothing else to do. So it's, uh, it's written in detail, and it covers, well, particle accelerators. You can skip that if you want. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, yeah, well, been focusing, whatever. And at some point, it'll actually start talking about actual, yeah, actual special relativity starting on what's labeled as page 69 or 11. So um, it, it goes through everything that, um, including like derivation of relativistic momentum formulas. Um, so um, if you're interested in additional material, you should read through it. It's like 30, 40 pages of material. But once again, to emphasize, this is for people who want to kind of, because uh, one thing I will tell you about relativity is that your book, it, this is the one topic where we cover more than the book does. And um, to the extent that it's covered on the exam, it's already reflected on your homework. <laughs> and if you feel like there's not enough written material to support you in making sure you knew that, uh, learn the material, then I'm telling you now, or oh, I guess you could just start out with the day five. Um, you, I, what I'll tell you is that these two days worth of the lecture notes, this is kind of what I covered in six hours of lecture when I was teaching this class, uh, is um, everything that I would expect people to know. Um, but once again, this is optional. Nothing that's solely here will be tested. For example, like all this space-time diagram, it's very useful too, but um, because none of your homework covered the space-time diagram thoroughly, I won't really test you on it. It is very useful too conceptually, so you know, it, it is useful too. But um, so all this written, at, and, oh, and so this is the portion where it talks about that uh, geometry of space-time. So first the rotation stuff you already know, and then this is the Lorentz four vector, and Lorentz transformation, Oops, where's the inner product? Um, hmm. Do I ever talk about Lorentz this rotation? Uh, it probably does it somewhere there, but look at that written material. <laughs> Good. Yeah, but once again, all these are, um, so that and this, they are all optional. Um, although some of the, yeah, they're all optional. Anything that's here that you might need to know, it's already covered in your homework. All right, so I think there's a couple formulas in special relativity that I haven't quite mentioned. Um, I th wait, in this class, did I ever go through? I did cover Doppler effect in this class, right? Yes. No, yeah, this, is, th this is what I cut out. Yeah, yeah I wanted it to. And I think you demonstrated this four vector form, that four vector of Wittmann. Yeah, okay, so okay. I think this is something that I can expect you to know. This is what I do expect you to know. So Doppler effect formulas, fine, whatever. 
what I do expect you to know, I lectured on it, it relates to Doppler effect is um, that there's one more four vector. And this one other example of four vector relates to wave quantities. So um, when you have like a wave of a form, like a, uh, just a, some amplitude times, let's just say cosine of omega t, oh, the way it's usually written is uh, kx minus omega t, like that's the uh, like traveling wave, right? So you have wave number k and omega, um, you have wave number k and angular frequency omega. It turns out these form a four vector. So the four vector that can be formed out of this is, um, let's see, the way I want to do this, c times, wait, c times omega? Let me do this correctly. No, just omega. Omega as occupying the time component and c times the three components of the wave number along the x, along the y, or along the z direction. This also forms a four vector. So this transforms under Lorentz transformation like these two. So um, I don't know. You, in your final exam, I probably wouldn't ask this. It's getting into way too much detail. I only have two hours to cover the whole semester. So <laughs> if I, you know, that would be the first thing to go. As in, I don't have enough space on the exam to ask that. Um, uh, if I were to, I would give you this background material first. I wouldn't expect you to know. For, I think it's uh, getting to be a little too much to kind of ask you to know where to put the correct factor of C. <laughs> so I would probably do that. So, um, so yeah, so this could relate to, um, this could relate to Doppler effect, but I think the, what it comes down to is, um, Doppler effect is a very, uh, Underemphasized the topic in this class. Uh, there are other things that relate to special relativity dynamics that I want to spend, wanted to spend much more time on. So Doppler effect is something that got de-emphasized and it's going to remain that way for your final. Um, I mean, your textbook does have a, like a section on it, Doppler effect for light. <laughs> but yeah, uh, read it, have the formulas written, but don't overstudy it because I, like. 90% likely that I, there won't be a single question on the Doppler effect. If there is, it'll be something conceptual that's on the multiple choice. Um, so I think that kind of covers everything. And um, I kind of alluded to this as I was writing this down. Really the thing that is, this comes down to a more abstract, theoretical, conceptual questions is the importance of relativity of simultaneity that whenever you're dealing with something that looks like a relativity paradox, oftentimes it comes down to the fact that you are implicitly assuming absolute simultaneity when there's no such thing. Um, now that's more or less it, I think. Um, did I forget anything? No, I don't, so um, the reason, the primary reason the, I would uh, couple special relativity with these topics is a lot of the examples for special relativity would come from here. So for Compton scattering, um, I can make that a particle physics example. You know, Compton scattering of photon with another particle electron, or photon with, well, not quarks, because they don't, free quarks don't exist. But um, 